Hi, good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Jan from um, Lord of the Harvest. Uh, with here, here with <laughs> my husband, Pastor Mike Kosminski, and uh, we will be delivering the rest of the service today. I want to open um, in Psalm 90. I'm not reading the whole thing today. I'm going in a whole different direction, uh, but I do want to open with the first verse. Uh, Psalm 90, 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you have formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. What a tremendous passage that is. Everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Well, the reason I switched from actually teaching on the psalm today was because um, I really felt this on my heart for a while, and it has to do with Christians acting like Christians, not a split personality, not uh, Dr. Heckel and Mr. Hyde, or is it whatever, you know what I mean? So. It occurred to me that in uh, about eight, 1989 or 1990, somewhere around there, we were all wearing bracelets called WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? It was really huge, huge, big undertaking, merchandise undertaking. You get bracelets, you could get bumper stickers, you could get shirts, you could get posters. And then I wondered, I'm like, where, where did this come from? Well, in... A hundred years previously, Charles uh, Spurgeon saying that uh, he just made a phrase, what would Jesus do? And then about five years later, Charles, um, Charles Sheldon wrote a book, In His Steps, and it was subtitled, What Would Jesus Do? And the thing was, he never got that book copyrighted, so that book got into the hands of a lot of people. So that phrase got out there. But then in 1990... Jeannie, and I love her last name, her last name is Tinkenberg. How would you like to have that last name? What a cool name. From Holland, Michigan, from our own state. Holland, Michigan, from the church, uh, the Calvary, Calvary Reformed Church. Re uh, re resurrected the saying, what would Jesus do? And the reason she did it, she was a youth leader, and she wanted kids to remember the phrase, the youth to remember the phrase when they're out and about. And then maybe a couple years later, she came up with another one called Frog, Fully Rely on God. So anyway, we have a part. We can be really proud, proud of those bracelets because they actually originated in Michigan. What would Jesus do? Now, you know, um, if you know a school teacher, you can ask her or him, what are some words that put fear into your heart? And there are those words in, a, in the life of a teacher. One is Halloween parties. Another is candy for snacks. And another one is recorders. Now, when I say recorders, if you don't know what it is, it's sort of like a flute, but it goes this way instead of sideways. And about third grade is when they first are introduced to a recorder by the music teacher in music class. So what happened one day was, unbeknownst to this third grade teacher, the music teacher had passed out recorders to her class. And when the teacher went to pick up the class at the, at the appropriate time, the kids were holding the recorder. She didn't probably even notice at that point until she crossed her threshold into her room and they pulled them all out and began playing all simultaneously off-key songs they made up. The teacher stood there, eyes bugged out, mouth dropped down, and she ran to her back room and yelled out, what would Jesus do? And I've never forgotten that story. What would Jesus do? Can you imagine? You have 30, 30 third graders with a recorder. What would Jesus do? I'd love to ask, ask him that question. Well, anyway, so I started thinking about our current situation in our country. And this really sprung out of the fact that um, 
when I, and I will admit, I was on Facebook. I still occasionally go on it. I try to stay off of it because like my one daughter said, Mom, it gets you upset. And it, it does. And the reason it got me upset was because there would be Christians on there uh, giving these beautiful scriptures. I mean, off the chart scriptures. And their next post would be vile and angry towards people that didn't believe like they did. And I started thinking, is that possible to share a scripture that conveys love and the next minute spew out of your mouth hatred about, it could be your very brethren, it could be people in your church, it didn't matter. It was hatred. And it really bothered me. It really, really bothered me that people could do that. I just felt like, that's, that's just not possible. Jesus would never do that. I, I, I can't picture him doing that. So then I started to think, well, what did Jesus do? What did he do? And then I thought of the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22. I have a funny little story about that too. My grandson attended the same school uh, I, I teach at, and in fifth grade, he had a teacher who... Every day, uh, not every day, but frequently taught the fruit of the Spirit. Now, mind you, he, he knew the Lord. Um, he, um, he actually was a converted Catholic, and he would go to Mass every day. He eventually joined a Bible study with some of his friends, and he religiously attends church and this Bible study, and he is a very solid, upstanding person. And he would, and I would always laugh, like, you know, you're really probably not supposed to be doing that in a public school, but he would teach the kids these things, like love, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now think about it. Do I place those in my life? When I get angry, do I use self-control? See, I believe these are characteristics, not only of the Holy Spirit, but characteristics of Jesus and the Father. I never saw in the scriptures Jesus losing control. And if you use the example about Jesus over-tipping the tables in the temple, that wasn't losing self-control. That was making a statement that you are not to use God as a way to make money. You are not to do that. That is below the line. But look at those things. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. That's, those are amazing characteristics to possess. And then what is love? And if you learn, if, if you turn to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, we hear this over and over and over again. We're at weddings. Because why? Because that's where people are coming together. Two people are coming together to carve out a life for themselves. And love has to be in there. And these are the things love needs to do. It never fails. In verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. When I'm snapping at the person that took my parking place at the mall, I've been sitting there waiting, and this person just turned the corner and popped in that place. Do I show kindness? Do I show love? More than likely not. I probably lose my top and start screaming. But love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. You know, that's a hard one because you can think, you know, Jesus even said uh, there were Christians out there, Christians performing acts in his name, but he didn't know them. Well, then why did they do it? For their own ego, to puff themselves up. Look how good I am. Love does not behave rudely. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one that cuts you right to the heart. I've seen a lot of Christians who are incredibly rude to other Christians. Forget other people, to other Christians. Does not seek its own. 
is not provoked, thinks no evil. Ooh, that's a hard one too. Wow. Does not rejoice in iniquity, in sin, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now, can I just say this? You know, we're in different situations in our life, all of us right now. Some of us are older. And I can remember, if you're my age and my generation, I can remember being taught to respect adults. And boy, I better tell that line. I remember this is a true story. This is, kind of, well, my kids would probably laugh, but I was walking down the street and a neighbor man was walking on the other side of the street going the opposite direction. And I kept looking at him, kept looking at him, because I was taught to always say hello to adults. And he would not look my way, so I just kept walking. Do you know when I got home, that man called my father and said, I want you to know that your daughter is rude. She did not say hello to me this morning. And I said, but dad, dad. And he said, you know what? Next time you say it first and you just say it whether he's looking at you or not. It was a generation where we respected. We respected. And I don't see that a lot going on right now in the world. And it's not just by younger people. It's by people my age. I'm taken back because I know, I know they weren't taught that. I know they weren't. So when we're in a situation and we are going to go to our emotions, we're going to, we're going to do what is our trigger. We're going to do what we always do. We need to stop. We need to stop and ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? See, we automatically do things because we have practiced it over seven times. Do you know when you practice something over seven times, it becomes a habit. Did you know that? And you can practice something wrong seven times, and it's a wrong habit. We always say to kids now, practice perfectly. That old saying, practice makes perfect, that's not true. It's practice perfectly makes perfect. I can learn something the wrong way. And I have learned a lot the wrong way. So guess what I have to do? I have to undo. I have to undo a lot. And how do I do that? I stop and ask myself, what would Jesus do? Now, there's a lot of things in this Bible we can find to support everything I've said. Do you know the first place that the word love was spoken was in Matthew, Matthew chapter um, 4, um, verse, um, ver actually, uh, I'm sorry, 3 verse 17. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, there you go. I have to be like Jesus. I have to do what Jesus did. You know what Jesus did to get that praise from the Father? He humbled himself and let John the Baptist baptize him. And in fact, John was, he, he, he was taken back. I shouldn't be baptizing you. You're God. You should be baptizing me. And you know what Jesus said to him? Permit it to be so now, for thus is the filling. I'm sorry, I can't read. It is the fitting, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. See, Jesus did everything for his father. He did everything. Can we say that? Can we say that? Now, you know, there's so many stories in here which display love. And the one I love is the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's in Luke chapter 10. And I know my husband is taught in this because, again, how do I know? I have notes in my Bible. Chapter 10, verse um, 30. And then Jesus answered and he said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest, and I have written there, a Christian man of God, came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Okay, Christian. Next verse. Likewise, a Levite knows 
I wrote here, knows God. He's also a Christian. My nails are so little. Okay. When he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Two Christians. But a certain Samaritan, a Muslim, I have written here a Muslim, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come back, I will repay you. So which of these do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? I mean, yeah, the thieves. I don't know who this man was that got hurt. Does it really matter? And I think for us, sometimes it does. That makes our decision whether they're going to help somebody or not. Is it my friend? Oh, is it somebody that is... Uh, an alcoholic and it's living on the streets. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. But you know what's interesting? Is Jesus was that Muslim. He was that person that picked that, that man up, cleaned him off, poured him oil on him, gave him wine. And it said, you know what it said to the innkeeper? When you come back, I will repay you for your kindness. See, God never misses what we do good or bad. And when we do things, when we fulfill the law, and we're going to look at his new commandment, he repays us. Not that we deserve it, but he does. Let's look in um, John chapter 13. And on the way, I just want you to think about this. Jesus went out and he collected 12 guys to be his close inner circle. He was going to train them. They're mismatched, misfits. You know, you have all kinds of different guys there from different backgrounds. You even have a tax collector there, hated by all people. So you have this um, interesting group of followers. And Jesus had faith that they would do what um, he told them eventually. He would, he would change the world. They would become gospel changers. They would become good news deliverers, whatever you want to call them. And in this, the chapter of 13, it is actually at the Last Supper. And Jesus is um, telling them that someone is going to betray him out of that group, that small group. And they are, they are like taken back. Because see, Jesus never let on which one it would be. They're, they're like, Lord, is it me? Am I going to be the one? Can you imagine Jesus showed no impartiality at all during that whole time, three and a half years when he was with those men, that they could ever figure out who was going to betray him? And then, you know, he whispers to Judas, whatever you have to do, do quickly. And when Judas, Judas leaves, they don't even figure it out. They think, oh, because he was the money handler that Jesus was sending him on an errand. And then what's so remarkable is Jesus washes their feet. And they're just like, if you've ever had your feet washed, it is the most humble experience in your life. You just want to sob and sob and sob that somebody, somebody is washing your feet. It's just a very humbling experience. It's a very God thing. It really is. So he washes their feet. And he dries their feet. And then he says to them, he says this. He says a lot of things in that chapter. Um, he says in 34, 1334, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. A new commandment. So we know the other two were love God first and love your neighbor. And now he's saying, you must love one another so the world will know you are my disciples. 
Are we seeing that in our world nowadays? I can tell you I'm not. I can tell you things that have happened that would definitely show how Christians are beating up other Christians based on opinions, based on beliefs. And I'm not talking about necessarily gospel beliefs. I'm talking about political beliefs. And I'm telling you, it is a sad day. It is a sad day. That is not God. God wants us to center on him and and love one another as he loved us. And how humbling the God of all creation washed feet. That's incredible. So when we partake of communion, I know this is a hard thing. This is really a hard thing to do what Jesus did. What would Jesus do? It's hard to do this. It's not easy. But unless we begin to, the world's lost. If we can't love one another, if we can't love members in our own church and members, Christians in other churches, if we can't do that, how can the world look to us to help them? How They're going to say we're a joke. So we need to get on our knees and we need to repent and we need to actually start stopping and thinking when we're in situations I have to retrain my brain. What would Jesus do? I know he wouldn't scream and yell. What would he do? So, Lord, I'm just thanking you that um, you've given us so many answers to so many questions about what we are to do. We can look in Galatians. We can look in Corinthians. And we see the nature of the Holy Spirit. We see the meaning of love. And you are. You said God is love. So, Lord, I ask, dear Jesus, as we partake today of communion, that remember the greatest love, you said, is for one man to lay his life down for another. We can't even be nice to one another, let alone dying for one another. So, Lord, give us the strength. Build us up, dear God. Make it so that we do go forth and act like you and love like you. And be humble like you. And be at peace like you. And be all the things it says in Galatians and in Corinthians. So Lord, we thank you for this bread. Your body that was given on the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus. What an incredible sacrifice you made for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. We really have to get ourselves into a different zone, mind zone, a different mindset. Some of us are living in a place. It's not God. It's not God. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this cup. We thank you for this blood. We thank you, Lord, for not thinking of yourself, but of your Father's will for us. Lord, what you did on that cross is incredible. It's incredible. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for choosing all of us, Lord. We're just like the disciples, just a mismatched group of misfits. But work with us, Lord. Make our mistakes, straighten them, make them perfect. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, have a blessed day and um, get ready for the word that's coming right now. Here he is. God bless you. Well, praise the Lord. For the word today, you know, we've uh, we finished book two of the Psalms several weeks ago. We just finished uh, book three yesterday, and we're starting into book four today. And I really want to look back at what we we have seen in book two, uh, what what we've we've seen in book three and what we're going to see in book four. That's, That's pretty adventurous, but I'm going to try to 
give an overview. Let's start with book two, book two of the Psalms. Now, now keep in mind, I, I, I want to make sure everybody understands this. There are five books in the Psalms, and they correspond to the five books of Moses. The rabbi said this, Moses was given five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So David was given five books as well in the Psalms, and they divide the five books into the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Deuteronomy books. In fact, when there's a quote in the New Testament from the Pentateuch or the Torah, those five books of Moses, it's, it, it will normally say, and Moses said, even though not every word in those five books is Moses speaking. Same thing at the Psalms, it'll say, and David said, even though David doesn't write all of the Psalms, he writes a considerable number of them, but he doesn't write all of them. But this is a picture of leadership, the importance of leadership in the whole economy of God's kingdom, in the, in the whole unfolding of God's purposes in human history. Leadership is of great importance. And when we look at the second, third, and fourth books of the Psalms, we see this emphasis on leadership. Now, if we go to the second book, book two in the Psalms runs Psalm 42 um, through Psalm 72. That's book two. And you have this, what's called the second Davidic Psalter, Psalm 51 through 72. The majority of, the, of those Psalms are attributed to David. In the superscription, in the heading of the Psalm, it says a Psalm of David. And it actually relates uh, quite a number of those Psalms, uh, not only in book uh, two of the Psalms, but book one, which the majority of the Psalms in book one, Psalm one through 41 are also attributed to David. So you have book two is this second Davidic Psalter, and we said Psalm 51 through 72. The purpose is to show how God establishes and makes provision for David's kingship. In book one, God establishes David as king. You know, Saul tried to steal the kingship from David or not allow the kingship to pass on to David. Saul wanted to keep it in his family. Book one of the Psalms deals with that. Book two deals with how God establishes and then makes provision for David's leadership to continue in spite of all the things that came against David. So Psalm 51 through 72 refer to David. But now there are bookends to, to Psalms 51 through 72, which refer to David, and that is Psalm 50 is a Psalm of Asaph, and then Psalm, as we go to book three, Psalm 73 through 83 are Psalms of Asaph. Now that's, Asaph is a prophetic worship leader. And what this says is that when God is establishing his leadership, in the body of Christ, among his people. You need prophets and a prophetic word to support that leadership. Now, as the Psalms of Asaph are bookends to Psalm 51 through 72, 50 is Asaph, 73 through 83 is Asaph, then you have another bookend of the bookend because Psalms 42 through 49 are the Psalms of the sons of Korah, and then Psalms 84 through 88 on the other side of Asaph's Psalms are also Psalms of the sons of Korah. And what's interesting about the sons of Korah, the sons of Korah are Levites. Now remember, the priests officiate in the temple. The Levites assist the priests 
in their officiating in the temple. They assist them. They they care for the sanctuary. The Korahites were Levites who were gatekeepers to the temple. They were also bakers. They 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 baked the loaves and the cakes that were offered before the Lord by the priest. And they're also prophetic worship leaders. So Asaph is a prophetic worship leader. The sons of Korah are prophetic worship leaders. And so you see surrounding the development of this legitimate leader, this king, David, through whom God will bless and favor all of Israel because one of David's descendants will always sit on the throne of Israel, establishing God's kingdom. And, 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 and we know that Jesus ultimately came from, the, from David's seed, from, from his lineage, his line, and so there, there are messianic consequences of this. But we also see, we see prophets surrounding the king. Now, it's interesting when we finish up with the Psalms of the sons of Korah and the Psalms of Asaph in this third book. Then we come to the fourth book, and the fourth book runs from Psalm 90 through Psalm 106. Now, what's unusual about the fourth book is that the headings, the superscriptions, only a few of those Psalms are given an author. Moses is the author of the 90th Psalm. David is the author of two of those 17 Psalms. And the other 14 Psalms do not have an author. Well, again, what the Jews teach on that is that Moses wrote all but those two. Moses is given the heading as the writer of Psalm 90, which Rob Elliott quoted today in in worship. And all those other psalms, except for the two that are ascribed to David, they were psalms of Moses. So we see David, that's a king. We see Moses, he's an apostolic prophetic leader before the kingship is established. And we see Asaph and Korah, who are prophetic psalmists, prophetic worshipers, prophetic teachers. We see leadership is very important. The Lord is showing that leadership is very significant in terms of the setup of how God administrates his kingdom. Now, we, we, we want to get some other principles about that leadership today as we look at all these things, but I want to establish that first of all. The other thing that I want to mention is that when you, you can also look at the Psalter, the 150 Psalms, the five books, not only do they bear witness to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and so become a parallel for Moses' life in David's life, in their, in their leadership, and how, how God moved in the midst of his people to establish his, his purposes in the time of Moses, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, delivering them from their oppression, bringing them through the wilderness and causing them to take the land and inherit the land. And then looking at it from David's standpoint, how David, how the kingship worked in Israel. The Psalms deal with how the kingship worked in Israel. It's looking at history from the perspective of the kingship while the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses deal with God, how God's history worked before there was the kingship, how, how God moved on his people to bring them out of Egypt. So book one of the Psalms deals with David's reign. Book two of the Psalms deals with the kingship of Solomon. Book three deals with the divided kingship when when Israel, the ten northern tribes, split from Judah, the two southern tribes, and the one nation becomes two nations. The fourth book, which we're about to go into, deals with exile. And the fifth book deals with the return from exile. So you can look at 
Psalms from, from both a, a mosaic perspective and a, a, a Davidic or kingship perspective. Now, here's something that's important. Let's look at it from the Davidic perspective. God removes Saul from king and establishes David. The Lord deals with true and false leadership in book number one. That's the history of, of David. In book number two, God transfers the kingdom from David to Solomon. And remember, for Solomon to get the kingship, to be the, the, the son of David who will take the inheritance and carry on the lineage, a lineage that must be preserved for Jesus to come through. Several of David's sons, uh, several of David's sons have to be disqualified. Adonijah, Absalom, all these sons of David, Solomon was the fourth in line, and three, three of David's sons get disqualified because they are not the ones that the Lord chose. That's the, the theme of the second phase of, of Israel's history. Book three deals with the divided kingship. And once the divided kingship takes place, when Israel and Judah are separated from each other, the judgment of God on Israel is, is literally set in motion. Because of division, because of the disqualification of false kings in, in the time of Saul and the time of Solomon's brothers, because of division that takes place in the third book, The Divided Kingdom, Israel seals her fate. Division brings the fourth phase of the fourth phase of the kingly history is exile. God's people go into exile and are chastised by the Lord so that they might be humbled. Their sin has to be dealt with by God. God has to humble his people. And once the humbling takes place, they return to the land they rebuild the temple, and they move forward. So there are two ways to look at the history that's taking place. So when we're moving into book three, all the Psalms that we were reading in book three, and we were looking at the prophetic significance of Psalms 73 through 83, the Psalms of Asaph in book three, the previous two weeks, which just leaves us with the Psalms of the sons of Korah, which complete book three and then lead us to the Psalms of Moses in book four, starting with Psalm 90 today. We're, we're in, in book three, which also corresponds to the Leviticus book, and the Leviticus book is about holiness. We also use the prophetic words of Asaph to show how God brings holiness into his people, how he forms holiness, and Look when God really deals with holiness. He deals with holiness in a time when the kingdom's divided. So holiness becomes a major issue when the church is divided. Right now, as my wife said, right now in the division that is in the church right now, God is going to be dealing with holiness. God is going to be dealing with issues of exile. God is going to chasten the church. This is, a, this, is a, this is not a time to be pointing the finger whatever side of the equation you're on. I'm not, we're not talking politics here. But the church has been divided by many things, and politics now have just contributed to the mix. We've been divided over doctrine. We've been divided over practices. We've been divided over spiritual experiences. We've been divided over prophecy. We've been divided over teaching. We're divided on such, so many levels that we've, we set the scenario for this political divisiveness. Now, and I, I, I want to make sure you understand something. I, I said, if 25 million Christians voted for uh, Trump, 25 million voted against him, I was just, just throwing that out as a figure. Statistically speaking, 
if you look at everybody who voted for Donald Trump who registered as a Christian or proclaimed to be a Christian and do the same thing with Biden, these are massive numbers. It's possible that over 50 million Christians voted for Donald Trump. And if you use the same statistics, over 40 million who call themselves Christians voted for Joe Biden. And by the way, this isn't, you know, um, American Idol. Well, 50 million voted for him and 40 million against the 50 million are right. No, it's the point I'm making is excessive numbers of Christians voted for him and excessive numbers voted against him. And the church cannot ignore that. Whatever side of the aisle you're on, well, you voted for, for, for the wrong guy. You're wrong. You voted for the wrong guy. You're wrong. You're not Christians. Again, it speaks of the division that is in the church. And so this whole issue of book three moving into book four is, is, is significant. It, it's of great consequences. Uh, hold that thought. I'll get back to it. I, I want to point out the, the, the titles of the five books, the beginnings of the five books, of Moses. I, I want to point something out to you when we talk about book one, two, three, four, and five in the Psalms. There's, there's a common theme at the beginning of every book of the Torah, the books of Moses. Genesis begins with what? And God said, let there be light. Genesis begins with God speaking his word. And his spoken word creates the universe. If you look at the beginning of Exodus, this is what Exodus says. And actually, the title for Exodus in the Hebrew is Shemoth, and it comes from the first words of that book. Exodus 1.1 says, These are the names. That's Shemoth. Name is Shem, Shemoth is plural. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, and then the name of the sons, the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 sons of Israel are named. You must speak a name into existence. You're going to see that the, the five books of Moses all have to do with speaking God's word. How does Leviticus, the third book, begin? The first words of the third book of Leviticus in Hebrew read this way. Leviticus begins with Vayikra, and in the Hebrew, and the Lord called. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of the meeting. God speaks the universe into existence in Genesis. In Exodus, God's servant, Jacob, speaks the names of his sons, which have prophetic significance. He speaks the word of the Lord and names his son. Book three, God calls to Moses and speaks to him. And then, of course, the second verse, what does God call to, to Moses? Speak to the people of Israel and say unto them. Book four, which is Numbers, Numbers is Bemidbar in Hebrew, and that means just wilderness. And Numbers one begins this way, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness. It's all about God, God's word. Deuteronomy is Devarim in Hebrew. And what Deuteronomy begins with, these are, these are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond Jordan in the wilderness. Everything about the book of Moses, and when we transpose those into the five books of the Psalms, it's about 
either God speaking his word or God's ministers speaking the word that God has given them. It's about, it's about hearing the word of the Lord. And so the Psalter, David, legitimate leadership in the five books of Moses, legitimate leadership in the five books of the Psalms has to do with hearing God speak and speaking what God says. Nothing more and nothing less. We, we hear a lot of people speaking a lot of things right now about our country, about the church. It's about what God's word says. And it's about what God's ordained leaders are called to speak. This is, this is the essence here. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, the Son can do nothing of himself except what he sees the Father doing. And then later in that same chapter, Gospel of John, chapter 5, the Son cannot do anything of himself as I hear, as I hear my Father speak, I judge. And my judgment is righteous. It's based in justice. Why? Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. God speaks. A David does what he sees the Father doing, does what he hears the Father commanding him to do, and speaks what he hears the Father saying. Why is he a qualified leader and Saul is disqualified? Why is Moses a qualified leader and Korah and Dathan and Abiram disqualified leaders? Because Moses and David seek not their own will, but the will of the Father. So, after Asaph speaks, Psalm 73 to 83, the remaining psalms, save one, and, and it's important why it's, that psalm is different from the others. It's a psalm of David. David gets one psalm in book three after having the majority of the psalms in the first two books. The majority of the first 72 psalms are David's psalms. He gets one in book three. He gets two in, in book four. Book three is dominated by the prophets, Asaph and Korah, because prophets speak in times of division. And book three speaks of the divided kingship. Prophets must be raised up, but they must speak the word of the Lord. And what those prophets will speak is holiness. So, okay, Psalm 73 through 83 are attributed to Asaph. We're going to go, we're going to go two places. We're going to go to Numbers 16, but first look at Psalm 84. So go to Psalm 84 because we left off with Psalm 83 last week. This is the first Psalm of the sons of Korah. And we said, Psalm 51 through 72, David, on either side of those Psalms, Psalm 50 and Psalm 73 through 83, Asaph. And on the other side of that, Psalm 42 through 49 and Psalm 84 through 89, sons of Korah. So you have this nice sandwiching, packaging effect. David surrounded by Asaph, surrounded by the sons of Korah. Psalm 84, look at the inscription. To the choir master, to, the, to him who gives the victory. Remember we said choir master in Hebrew means to him who gives the victory. And it's attributing these psalms to the ultimate choir master, the Lord. Not a worship leader in Israel, not David, but the Lord, who's the ultimate choir master, who directs the psalms of worship that establish God's kingdom purposes in the earth in his ancient people, Israel, and his present people, the church. The Psalms is as much of a guide for us in terms of how the Lord establishes his kingdom in the earth as it was for Israel. To the choir master, according to the Gittith, and the Gittith is the, or the Gittith, is the 
wine press. That's, a, that's an interesting picture because we know grapes are crushed to get the wine. And see, grapes aren't destroyed when they're crushed. Their real essence, their real purpose emerges in the crushing. See, when God puts his people in the Giddeth, when he puts his people in the wine press, and remember, the book three is, he, it's, we're on our way to exile. We're going to be judged by the Lord. We're going to be chastened by the Lord. We're going to be humbled by the Lord. We're going to go into exile. And in that humility, God is going to crush the grapes and bring forth the bread and the wine. See, that the, the, the crushing of the Lord does not destroy. The crushing of the Lord will never destroy his people. The intent is never to destroy. Oh, you said God's judging his people. He doesn't judge his people. Yes, he does judge his people. He crushes the grapes so that the wine comes forth. Our real essence emerges. And that's why we trust the Lord's hand, regardless of who's president. We trust the Lord's hand regardless of what happens to the nation. God's people have flourished under good nations, like America. God's purposes have flourished under oppressive nations where Christianity is outlawed. God's people, the Lord uses the circumstances to bring forth the wine from the grape. Our real essence is established. And it's a psalm of the sons of Korah. Now remember, bookends, Korah, 42 through 49, bookends to this whole story of David and the the prophecy of Asaph. The prophecy of Asaph is bookended by the prophecy of the sons of Korah. Why? All right, well, let's look at this. 84.1, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Do you know the expression living God is only used one other place in the Psalter, in the Psalms? Keep your finger in 84, cut it in half, and go to Psalm 42. 42 is the first book, uh, the first Psalm of Book 2, where David's kingship, God makes provision for David's kingship to, be a, to, to, to continue after it's been established. Psalm 42, 1 begins like this. As the deer pants for the flowing streams of water, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Oh, only other time in the Psalter where that phrase is used. Who wrote Psalm 42? To the choir master, a maskil, a wisdom psalm of the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah are there to remind us prophetically. When God drives us into the desert, when he drives us into times where it seems like our very life force is dried up, when God drives us into exile, when God brings us through I just got a question, and I rarely notice the questions. What's the Psalter? The Psalter is P-S-A-L-T-E-R. The the book of Psalms, good question, because if you've got that, so do others. The book of Psalms, when you put them together, is called the Psalter. It means the book of Psalms. All right. So where is the living God also mentioned? Sons of Korah. Now notice, 42 begins book two with the same idea that book three is ending with. Continue on. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now this is all about water. It's about flowing streams. It's the, it's the deer panting for the flowing stream. It's my tears have been my food night and day, water coming from my eyes. While they continually say, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. Verse 5, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Have hope in God. 
My soul is cast down within me. I will remember you, Lord, from the Jordan, from the Hermon, from Mount Mazar, from all the, the boundaries of Israel. Deep calls on the deep. Here's more water at the sound of your waterfalls. So we, we look for a stream. We look for tears coming for our eyes. We look for a, a precious waterfall. The water pours down the mountaintops. And when, when the, the dry season, the wintry dry season in Israel waits for the, for the, for the former rains to come, the early rains to come, and, and where these dry desert eddies begin to overflow with waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. And now it's talking about a person drowning in the sea. All these images of water. But there's a hope. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love and at night his song is with me. God's steadfast love is there for us. Now go back to 84. Watch. Living God is brought up the only other time in, in the Psalter. We'll read it again. It's going back to the dwelling places. Now, if we were to continue to read through those early Psalms of Korah, we get to, you know, there's, there's this lament, 42, 43, and 44, individual and communal laments. 45 is a messianic Psalm. In the midst of the lament of God's people, there's a reminder there will be a descendant of David who will come to deliver you. Messiah, the King, the Lord. Remember the way the Psalter's organized. Psalm 1 is about the righteous versus the wicked, and Psalm 2 is about the Messianic King. And those two Psalms uh, speak, they set in motion the, the entire th major themes of, the, of, of all 150 Psalms. Obedience, and the Messianic King. But there's another way to look at it. The Psalter, Psalm 1, begins with obedience. It ends, Psalm 150, and actually a number of the Psalms that lead up to 150, particularly 146 to 150, it ends up with worship. So there's a, a big picture of the, God's prophetic purposes in the Psalms. We begin in obedience and we end in worship. And what it is saying is this, as we begin to see the hand of God through Hebrew history, as we note it through New Testament history, Matthew through Revelation, as we look through church history, the Lord always starts with obedience as he reveals himself, the awe and the majesty and the wonder of the one who shows that he's in control of history, that when he promises, he fulfills. What he says he'll do, he does. And he is in control of human history, not communism or Islam, uh, radical Islam or, or wickedness or evil leaders. He is in control. The awe and the majesty of God as he reveals himself to us moves us from obedience to worship. Now those two are, do not, are, aren't opposites. It's not obedience without worship or worship without obedience. It means our obedience increases as we become devoted to him, as we see him the way he really and truly is, as we see him the way he is. If you love me, if, if, if you really see me for who I am, Jesus said, you'll keep my commandments. So the whole Psalter moves from obedience to worship. So in those, those early Psalms of Korah, talking about water, when we get to Psalms 46, 47, and 48, they're songs of Zion. See, the, the, the sons of Korah speak of the Psalms of Zion. Zion is a place where God establishes his presence and his kingship. And the, the so sons of Korah are actually moving us away from human kingship. The kingship of David ultimately fails. 
When we get to the divided kingdom and Assyria destroys the 10 northern tribes, Babylon destroys the two southern tribes, and the people of God are moved into exile, they have no king. And they never again have an earthly king until, of course, Jesus comes. But in book four, Moses now becomes the ideal leader. David is the ideal leader in book one and two of the Psalms and book three, which we're finishing up. Where is David? What happened to David? We've got a divided kingship right now. Where, where's, where's our ruler? Where's our leader? Moses, who writes the majority of the Psalms in book four, 90 through 106, he writes all but two, moves from the kingship of man to the kingship of God. The central theme in book four is the kingship of God. We need leaders, we need godly leaders, and we're going to finish up with, with describing that. But we need the real leader, the ultimate leader, Jesus. We can vote for whomever we choose. We can favor whomever we choose. But our real king, Jesus, that's, that's who we're looking toward. Now let's continue with Psalm 84 again. How lovely is your dwelling place. First verse, O Lord of hosts, my soul longs yet faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at her altars, O Lord of hosts. And this is an interesting picture. In the midst of all this ornate, this temple, the place where God's presence is. I mean, my gosh, only the high priest can go in the Holy of Holies. And if anybody else tried to go in there, be destroyed and offer strange fire as Nadab and Abihu did in the book of Leviticus, the holiness book, offering strange fire. And here, a sparrow makes a nest in the altars of the Lord, finds a little spot, a crevice, and makes a nest. Now, birds have a homing device. They come back to where they built the nest the year before and the year before. We have a cardinal in our tree right outside our window where I'm pointing right there. We have a cardinal. Tar cardinal comes back every year and, and, and builds the nest there in our tree. Homing device. And what it's saying is Zion. That's the place of God's presence. And it isn't that God brings his presence into our midst. He calls us to the place where his presence is. And that's what God wants to do with the church. The church wants Jesus to come and bless their doings right now. Well, I believe this. I think this. I feel this. I want this. Come and bless me. No, the, the Lord wants maturity in the church. The church has to grow up right now. And the maturity is, Jesus isn't coming to you. You go to Jesus. Go to Zion. And that's what the Psalms of Zion are all about. And it's the sons of Korah who say that. Say we have to be like the bird. There's a homing device in us that says, I'm lost until I find the place where God is. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. Now watch the next image. Remember the previous imagery in Psalms 42 through 49? It's water. And, and by the way, the ultimate water that the sons of Korah are looking for are in Psalms 46, 47, 48. There is a... There is a river, the streams of which make glad the city of God. And where is the city of God? Zion. See, Zion is not just a place where, oh, I go to church and, and God's presence comes, or I, I, I prayed last night and had a powerful experience with Jesus. Zion is where the kingship of the Lord is established. He doesn't need to come to us. We need to go to him. Now look at verse 5 of Psalm 84. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. See, Zion is the place where the strength of God is. We need to go there. The, the children of Israel, three times a year, had to go from all their native lands and go up to where, where God was in Jerusalem. 
See, we've so domesticated Christianity. Oh, God, isn't the Lord beautiful? He comes to us. He is beautiful. He does come to us. He makes his, his, he, his father and he and his spirit come and dwell within us. But maturity is we have to go where God is. That's what the Psalms are teaching us. Church, in this hour, quit demanding God comes to you and the Lord's going to support the way I see America should be. The Lord's going to support the way I voted. The Lord's going to, what I see is good and what I see is good is good and what I see is evil is evil. No, no, no. Grow up, church. Go to where God is. Go to where he is king and where he is king. What did Psalm 73 start with? What's real holiness? Then I stood, 73, 16, and 17. Then I stood in the sanctuary. See, we have to go where God is and see things from the way he sees those things so that we can truly see. So, And when we truly see him, we will come into an awestruck, wondrous devotion to the king and we will move from obedience to obedience and worship and that's psalm 1 to psalm 150 but psalm 2 is and you're not going to get there unless you kiss the son unless you go through the messiah unless you listen to the one whom the lord said this is my beloved son in whom my soul takes delight listen to him that's the gospel that's the gospel. Verse 5, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. This is talking about making a pilgrimage. We're to, we, the church needs to make a pilgrimage, particularly in the divided kingdom. It became difficult to make a pilgrimage because the, the, the temple was in Judah. The two southern tribes, the ten northern tribes, well, they were different nations and they were at odds with each other, but the Lord said, oh, I, I, I separated Israel and Judah, but you all better come to the temple in Jerusalem where I am. And that made the pilgrimage more difficult. And then after Israel was in exile, it was really difficult because now the people were scattered all over, all over the, the Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean areas. And they had to make a long pilgrimage. Church, we're far away from God. We need to make a long pilgrimage. And by the way, what Pastor Jan said is the word of the Lord. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. We got, we got to make the pilgrimage back to Zion where God is. Because where God is, there's unity among his people. And then it says, again, I'll repeat the fifth verse. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion as they go through the valley of Baca. Baca is the valley of tears, the valley of sorrow. They make it a place of springs. Baca is also a place when you're making a winter pilgrimage, it's dry. And the tears come to your eyes from the dry season in which you find yourself. The hot, arid, dry season making a pilgrimage to Zion, but their tears become seeds that are sown to bring forth the river of God. They make it a place of springs, and it refers to the early rains, also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. The strength is the vision of the Lord the vision of his purposes, obedience to his will, listening to the Holy Spirit, retraining your practices, as Pastor Jan said, to appear before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold our shield, O God. You are our shield. Look on the face of your anointed one, your Messiah. See, the Messiah is there. See, David, where, where's, where's the kingship? Where's David? David's gone. Read the 89th Psalm, which is the final psalm in book three. It starts out with, God made his promises to David. The next section, long psalm, the next section, God made his promises, and it shows everything God did right. And the key word that emerges from Psalm 89 
is God's steadfast love. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. God's made a covenant with David. He's going to keep it. God's fulfilled his part. And then you get to the third part of the psalm and says, yeah, but we haven't fulfilled our part. And Lord, we're in trouble right now. We're in trouble right now. We're on the verge of exile. Israel's been destroyed. Judah's going to be destroyed or Judah is destroyed. And there's no king. Where's David? You, you said you'd keep a man on the throne and now there's no David. And then Psalm 90 starts book four with the prayer of Moses. And Moses starts a whole series of Psalms that say, it's okay if you don't have a human king on the throne. I'm your king. And it's the reversal of the, 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 the Saul error. The Saul category error where the people demanded a king instead of trusted the Lord as their king. They demanded a king, so God gave them a king as, as, as one prophetic brother in the body of Christ has said is a, a people, a nation, gets the leaders it deserves. And if that, if, if, if you think, oh yeah, Biden, I said that four years ago when Donald Trump was running against Hillary Clinton. I said, we're already under judgment, whoever we get. And I hold to that today. But that's not the main issue. The issue is God is king. So Moses starts out in Psalm 90 saying, it's a prayer of Moses, the man of God, the one who went before God. And we'll look more at this maybe even next week. Moses, remember, goes before God the children of Israel come to Sinai in the wilderness. They've been delivered from Egypt. They've gone through the Red Sea. Signs and wonders, miracles. The Lord has provided water from the rock, manna from heaven. God is moving powerfully. They get to Sinai. And the Lord says, Moses, come on up and get, get, get the law from me. Get the, the, the stipulations of my covenant relationship, bring them back down to my people. Moses goes up and he sees the Lord. He's up there 40 days and 40 nights. He comes back down. He's been in the presence of God. He's got the two tablets of the law and the people are worshiping false gods. The people rebel. 40 days was all it took them to rebel against the Lord. While Moses went up there, God must have Kill them. He's not back 40 days. See how human beings do. We take situations. God's got everything perfectly in control. And we superimpose our flawed reasoning to them. And we make decisions. That's, that's opinions. See, there was a conspiracy theory going through the camp that Moses died. We read it on the internet. We read it on the internet. Moses is dead. So let's just worship a golden calf. Let's go back to Egypt. They were following conspiracy theories back then. We put our own spin and our own interpretation on events. God had everything under control. He comes back down. The people are rebelling against the Lord. Moses destroys the, the tablets and the Lord calls him back up to the mountain and he says, I'm I'm finished with these people. I'm going to destroy them. And Moses intercedes and says, please, Lord, don't give them another chance. And the Lord does. See, that's the prayer of the man of Moses. So, so even when division destroys not only Israel and Judah, but destroys the kingship that the Lord was going to bring and establish his purposes through in Psalm 89, Psalm 89 ends up, where the heck are you, Lord? Well, Psalm 91 says, here's where he is. Psalm 90 begins with, here he is. And then Psalms 91 through 100 just speak about the kingship of God. Finishing up Psalm 84. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your Messiah. That's what it says, the anointed, the Mashiach. Look on the face of Jesus. David might be gone. Israel and Judah might be gone. America might be gone. The Republicans might be gone. The Democrats might be gone. Oh my God, everything's gone. The Messiah is here. Look at the face of your anointed, Lord. And if your anointed's here, it's fine. The kingdom of God is going 
gonna, going to be established in the earth because the Messiah is there. The kingdom doesn't rise and fall on who's the president. The kingdom doesn't rise and fall on who's the, the, the righteous man or is it capitalism or communism or, or, or liberalism or conservatism. The kingdom of God doesn't rise or fall on that. The kingdom of God rises and falls. Lord, look on the face of your anointed one. We're in trouble, but look on the face of your anointed one. And the Lord looks and says, nobody's in trouble. Not, not my divided people, not my people in exile, not my disobedient people, not my people who need to be humble. Nobody's in trouble. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. Who were the sons of Korah? They were gatekeepers, doorkeepers. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withheld, withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Now, I said, sons of Korah. What's significant about the sons of Korah? Number 16. Numbers 16 relates the story of Korah. Now remember, we're still in book three of the Psalms. It's the Levitical book. It's the book of holiness. Look at, look at the issue with Korah. Why are, why are the sons of Korah in this book? Numbers 16, one. Now Korah, the son of Ezar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with a number of people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. This is going to be a rebellion against the authority of Moses. Watch their basis. These are leading men, key figures, who are rising up against the man God appointed, Moses, actually Moses and Aaron. And he appointed Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, apostle, prophet, teacher, prophetic leader, prophetess, priest. They assembled themselves against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far for, now watch, it's an issue of holiness. Book three, sons of Korah. You have gone too far, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Here's the issue of holiness, brethren. Holiness has to do with whom God has separated to lead his people. See, they're claiming equality. We're all equal. We're all holy. We're a kingdom of priests. Who do you think you are to exalt yourself, Moses? Who do you think you are to tell us? Why? It's just your opinion and my opinion is just as good as yours. And the Lord is going to say, no, it's not. See, we live in a sickeningly egalitarian reality right now. Oh, everybody's equal. Everybody's opinion is equal. That's why so much nonsense and false prophecy, garbage is going out on the internet. Garbage is coming out from politicians, leaders. Garbage is coming out from Christians. Garbage is coming out from people, every level of society. Why? Because we're all holy. Our opinions are all equal. Our opinions are not all equal. Five books of Moses. God spoke the world into existence. God spoke to Moses, not to anybody else. God spoke to Moses, not to anybody else. God spoke to Jacob. He named the son, his sons prophetically because God spoke to him. And Moses spoke the word because God raised him up. We're not all equal. Holiness, all are holy, all have a purpose in the body of Christ, but not all are appointed by God to lead. You exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord. Now, actually, and we're going we're gonna to look at Numbers 12 as well. This is the very opposite of what Moses is. Moses is a humble man. He's a meek man. 
That's why he has such authority with God. Humility is the key to authority. People who abuse and misuse power are people who are not humble, not accountable to anybody else. Moses is humble. But notice the people who are proud, Korah, accuse Moses of the very sin that they possess. And you have to understand this now. Right now, this is a big thing. If you don't agree with me, well, you're just under the spirit of Jezebel. Okay, you're telling me I'm under the spirit of Jezebel. Well, wait a second. You're under the spirit of Jezebel because you're telling me I'm under the spirit of Jezebel. That's how it works. This is how Jezebel works. This is how pride works. This is how sin works. Romans 2 says it clearly. Therefore, O man, right at the start of Romans 2, you who judge are guilty. You're guilty because in the very words that you condemn another, judge another, you condemn yourself because you're guilty of the same things. This is how the spirit of Jezebel works. It projects its own sin onto other people. That's, that's, that doesn't mean we don't sit down and have a teaching about Jezebel. But see, the problem with Jezebel in Revelation chapter 2, the prophetess was tolerated. It, is, it isn't that we fight about who's Jezebel. It's that the church has to stop tolerating Jezebel. See, when you stop tolerating Jezebel, Jezebel's power will be broken. And when we allow people to bring baseless accusations, well, we have problems. When Moses heard Korah say this, he fell on his face and he said to Korah and all his company, in the morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring that one who's holy near to him. See, it's about leadership. Bringing someone near unto you. Blessed is the man whom the Lord forgives his sin and causes him to draw near in him. That's about establishing legitimate leadership. So may I say, let me say something prophetically. Everybody else says something prophetically. Let me say something prophetically. The Lord is going to show in this hour who is holy and who is not. This isn't just going to like, oh, blow away or we'll just, we'll get over this division in the body of Christ. There are people who are accusing. There are people who are claiming their holy, their opinions, their words. And there are, are others who are just saying, Let's look to Jesus and, and, and trust him, trust his word, trust the gospel. Well, the Lord is going to show who speaks for him. Now, I want you to see the context in, in Numbers 16, how the Lord does that. The one whom he chooses, chooses, he will bring near to him. Do this, take censers. A censer speaks of intercessory prayer. When you take an incense holder, it speaks of intercessory prayer. So this has to do with whose prayer will God answer? See, there, there are people praying for Donald Trump to get in. There are people praying for Donald Trump to get out. Well, when all this clears, let's see, and they're, they're both Christians, let's see whose prayer God answers. And there are people, of course, praying, Lord, let, let your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There may be multiple. There, there, there may be multiple. All men are created equal. All men are not equal in terms of the gift that they have and the authority they have. That's what's in question. This isn't, he's, he says, all God's people are holy. What he's saying is everybody's opinion is equal. And the Lord is saying, no, it's not. My opinion and those who speak for me have a level of holiness and authority because it's truth. It's rooted in truth. So take your censers, Korah and all his company, put fire in them and put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow, and the man whom the Lord chooses will be the Holy One. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. Moses is saying, God gave me this position, and I'm speaking the word of the Lord, and now you're saying, 
your opinions are equal to what God is speaking through me, when your opinions are different from what God has spoken to me, the Lord said, you've gone too far. And Moses said to Korah, hear now, you sons of Levi, is it too small of a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to them? And that he has brought you near to him and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. Would you seek the priesthood also? Therefore, it is against the Lord that you and your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you grumble against him? Aaron is a man who was chosen by God. See, people are not satisfied with the position, the gifting, the authority, and the purpose that God gives them. They look at somebody else and they want that. They desire that. A man can have nothing except it be given him from God, is what John the Baptist said. This is the, this is the bait. We have a conflict of authority going on right now in the body of Christ just like this. Watch. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. Korah influenced members from other tribes. See, leadership that that revolts against God's designated leadership, leadership that embraces falsehood against the truth that is in God's leadership, causes other people to stumble as well. We will not come up. Is it a small thing that you brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you must also make yourself a prince over us? See, they, they, they looked at the fact that Moses was in leadership and they didn't like that. They wanted to be in leadership, so they accused him of all these false accusations. God gave him the position. Moses didn't take it on himself. If you study the story from early in Exodus 3 when the, the, Moses saw the burning bush, he didn't want the position. See, there's, 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 there's a rule of thumb. Watchman Nee said this many years. People who want to be in charge have no idea of what it means to be in charge. People who don't want to be in authority understand the grave responsibility of being in authority. See, Mike Osminski has to get it right or Mike Osminski may perish. The rest of you, you don't, you're, not, you're not in the same position as I am. I mean, all leaders are. But I'm talking about other people who aren't in a position of leadership. You can screw up and make a mistake and go to sleep and wake up the next day. Moses smites the rock instead of speaks to it, and he's, he's forbidden to enter the promised land. It's not going to happen to everybody unless, of course, they sin. So, Moses... All of this happens. They all, we, we got we to gotta skip down and we've got to see what happened in the midst of this rebellion. Drop down to verse 25. They're, they're, all the reasons for rebelling, it's, it's irrelevant. They're just rebelling. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram and the elders of Israel followed him. Verse 25. And he spoke to the congregation. He says, get away from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away with all their sins. So they got away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of the tents together with their wives, their sons, and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works and that it has not been of my own accord. Even if these men, I mean, if these men all die or if they're visited by the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates something new, in other words, if they die a normal death, well, we all, we're all going to die. It doesn't prove anything. But if the Lord creates something new and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belong to them and they go down alive into shale, then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. Well, we know it happened. <laughs> ground opens up, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram with their prayers before God. Moses and Aaron with their prayers before God. And we know that all who belong to Korah and their goods perish in verse 32. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive in the shale and the earth closed over them and they perished from the assembly. Fire comes from the Lord and then what 
takes place after that? Well, if you read the remainder of the chapter, COVID-19 hits the camp. The Lord sends a plague. The Lord sends a, a, a pandemic among the people. And again, it's only Moses and Aaron's prayer and intercession for the people that, that removes the plague. See, the whole context of plague has to do with false accusation in the body of Christ. It has to do with fights over who speaks for the Lord. It has to do with fights over whom God has chosen. And we have seen this for centuries going on in the church. And you know what? The Lord's going to do something about it. We have a plague taking place in our nation, that, 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 that in our world that kind of sets this whole thing in a context. Plagues are sent by the Lord. One reason is when there are disputes over who is speaking the word of the Lord. And boy, there are a lot of disputes now. The church has to get right. Now, go back to Numbers 12. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close, close up here because we're still dealing with the issue of legitimate leadership. Numbers 12. Numbers 12 happens before Numbers 16. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman he'd married, for he married a Cushite woman. It's very interesting. Moses, before Korah and Dathan and Abiram rebel against Moses and Aaron, Aaron and Miriam rebel against Moses. See, I've tried to explain this to my leadership in the church, to the leadership in the body of Christ. When you rebel against the one whom the Lord has set in your midst, you not only have issues yourself that God's going to deal with, but you set in motion a Dathan and a Biram and a Korah. See, it's Aaron and Miriam who set in motion Dathan, Abiram, and Korah, because they rebel against Moses. Moses is always getting rebelled against, poor guy. But notice, it's because, it's interesting, a, a mixed racial marriage. Moses, a Jew, his wife, a Cushite, an African. Problems, right? Racial problems. We don't have racial purity here, Moses. And they rebel against him. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he spoken also through us? See, this is this issue. Well, you, you claim to hear God. Well, we hear God too. That every single church division in church history is rooted in, well, you think you hear God. Well, we hear God too. Well, somebody's not hearing God and the person that God has placed in authority, the one we have to hear. Now we know ultimately that means Jesus. But again, the whole purpose in the Psalms, we raise up a David, we raise up a Moses to shepherd God's people. God wants to shepherd his people. Now, here's the problem. It wasn't that Moses heard Miriam and Aaron speak this. It says the Lord heard it. See, the Lord hears. The Lord hears what people say in the secret places. The Lord hears what people say behind other people's backs. The Lord hears, and that's all that matters. Who cares whether the, the, the designated leader, the David or the Moses, hears it? God hears it, and the Lord heard it. Now notice, here's a verse, important verse to understand. This is so important for us to understand. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. A meek person is a humble person. Person. Now, this is important. This is going to be my final point. What is God doing to the church right now? What is God doing to America right now? God is humbling his people. He's humbling this nation. Why? Because the only way you can really hear God is if you are humble. See, people who, who, are, who come to God with preconceived desires, notions, and agendas, do you know what they hear? They hear what they've position themselves in their heart to hear. The only person who can truly hear God is a humble, broken person who comes before the Lord and says, if you speak for me, hallelujah, Lord. If you speak against me, hallelujah. See, that that's doesn't exist in the church right now. The church can't deal. Right now, one of the, I would say the biggest issue 
When I see in leaders in the body of Christ, leaders who like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram are leading God's people astray right now. They can't, they can't take criticism. They, they cannot hear you've sinned before the Lord. They can't hear you're wrong and somebody else is right. Now watch, watch the sequence here. Moses was very meek. He's a humbled man more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord came to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam. Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called to Aaron and Miriam and they both came forward and he said, hear my words. Listen to this, church. Listen to this. If there is a prophet among you I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Yes, Aaron. Yes, Miriam, your prophets. I speak to you in visions and dreams. But that's not how I speak to Moses. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. He's faithful. He's broken and humbled He's faithful. Faithful. A faithful man means, this is what a faithful man is. If I, as a pastor, tell somebody to do something and they do it, that's a faithful person. If I tell somebody to do something and they say they'll do it and then they don't do it, they're not a faithful person. If I tell somebody do it and they just say, no, I'm not going to do it, that's not faithful. Faithful is I speak, you do. See, that's what makes us humble. That's what makes us accountable. That what, that's what enables us to hear the real word of the Lord. Not so with my servant Moses. He's faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in prophetic riddles. He beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And of course, Miriam gets judged just as the, the people who followed Korah and Dathan got judged, just as the people who, even after seeing Korah and Dathan, grumbled against Moses and the plague came. But in every circumstance, whether it's at the Mount Sinai, if it's at Mount Sinai, where the Lord wants to destroy the people and Moses says, please don't do it. And the Lord says, okay, I changed my mind. Or it's, or it's when the COVID-19 or we'll call this COVID-1419 uh, uh, BC. Uh, when the COVID, when the plague comes, Moses and Aaron pray for the people. And when Miriam, the very one who accused Moses, is judged by the Lord, Moses prays for her. See, that's the one thing about those who have real authority in God's kingdom. Their prayers are answered, and they pray for God's people. That's what qualifies them to be shepherds of God's people because they care more about God's people than themselves. They care more about God's people than their own affirmation. They care more about God's people than their own acclaim, than their own power. They're not power abusers. They know that God has given them authority to bless and not to curse. Now, the Lord's the one that judged Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. But every chance that Moses had to pray, to spare God's people who are being judged, he prayed. Intercessors, those of you with intercessorial authority, you better be careful what you pray, and you better be careful what you say. I find myself so often by myself, I get really angry with somebody, and I, oh, it, I would love to say this to them. And right there, the Lord says, don't you even dare think that. You better pray something different right now. You, I wasn't really saying that, Lord. The, the thought just went through my head. Well, you better pray something different because you have a certain amount of authority. <laughs> I don't have a lot of authority, but God has given me authority for the people that he's placed under me. We need to be careful. Now, let's go back to Psalms and finish up. Go back to Psalm. We, we left off on 84. So what, what, what happens here? Why is it so important that the sons of Korah, the sons of Korah, 
are writing these psalms. Well, it sounded like from Numbers 16 that uh, everybody in Korah's family was judged. Everybody in Korah's family was judged. Well, you read on a little bit further in Numbers. You don't have to read it for you. I'll read it, but it's in Numbers 26, um, verses 8 through 11, where it talks about how Dathan, Abiram, and Korah and their families were judged by the Lord. The earth opened up and they fell into it. And then it says in 26, 11 of Numbers, but the sons of Korah did not die. Do you see how important the sons of Korah are in the Psalms? They were pardoned. They were humbled. The fear of the Lord came upon them. And because they saw the fear of the Lord, and because they were humbled by God, they didn't persist in their rebellion. For whatever reason, all the rest of the family went along with dad. But the sons of Korah stopped. The fear of God gripped them, and they were spared. And so these Psalms of Zion, these Psalms that prepare God's people, for the real river of God. The Psalms that call God's people to Zion, to where the Lord is king and he is Lord. They're written by people who were humbled. Moses got where he was because he was humbled. Moses heard God speak face to face, not in a vision or a dream, face to face communication because he was humbled. What does God do in exile? He humbles God's people. The church is going to be humbled in this hour. The church is going to be humbled in this hour, but the church will be spared. The Lord's desire is to show forth his mercy. Look at Psalm 86. It's the only Psalm of David, and this is where we're going to close. Only Psalm of David in, in book three, the Leviticus book. All, all the rest are Asaph, Korah. And this prayer is great is your steadfast love, O Lord. David says, and what it's saying is even after David's gone, because this is the divided kingship, even after all the kings of David are, are going to cease, the Davidic kingship is going to cease. That's where Psalm 89 leaves us. But of course, then Psalm 90 starts out with it. But Moses is still there to pray to God to get him to change his mind like he did with the children of Israel. And intercessors pray for God to change his mind right now. Lord, don't judge the church. Lord, don't judge your people. Don't judge the, the, the fools in your church that are speaking foolishness right now. Don't judge the fools in this nation, Lord, that are speaking foolishly. Don't judge, don't even judge the Korahs, the Dathans, and the Abirams. Lord, we have the blood of Jesus. Forgive your people. Heal your people. Change your mind, Lord. I don't know what you're planning to do with America. To me, it, it I wasn't worried about who was going to be president. It looked to me like God's going to, Blow this thing up. Please, Lord, change your mind. God will do that if you get a Moses to intercede. May we all become a Moses. We're just all little Moseses. Now, we don't need a, a big Moses. The big Moses is Jesus. And by the way, Jesus, he makes intercession for us next to the throne of God, and he's praying, Father, don't destroy them. Father, redeem them. Father, heal them. Father, heal the division, the brokenness, the confusion, the lies, the disobedience in your church. Do it, Lord. So David says, and so David is inserted here. This is the only psalm in the book to say, oh yeah, and, and David did this too. We're going to show you that Moses is going to do it in the whole next book, but David did it too. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. And notice how David starts, for I am poor and needy. I'm not the king. I'm not the boss of you. I'm not the greatest president who ever lived. I'm not here to rescue anybody. Even though I was the man after God's own heart and I had more authority than any king who ever lived in Israel, like Moses, you humbled me, Lord. You brought me into this kingship to lead your people and you humbled me, Lord. I'm one of the poor ones. I'm one of the needy ones. See, this is what, 
the Psalms is exalting. This is the kind of leader that will shepherd God's people. Not a Saul. Not even a Solomon who starts out great and wealthy and wise and, 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 and ends up with all kind of problems. I, idolatry. Not a Hezekiah. Not a Josiah. Not a... All these great kings. No. David, I'm poor and needy. I need you, Lord. Preserve my life, for I am a chesed one. I'm one who is immersed in your steadfast love. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Now there's this language of servant and master all through this. See, when Lord is written, if, if your Bibles spell Lord in a capital L, small O, smell, small O, small, small R, small D, that's Adonai. That's master. That's not a name. That's a title. When Lord is in capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital E, that's Yahweh. David refers to himself as the servant of the Lord, and he uses Adonai a great number of times because this is a master and a Lord thing. He's ultimately saying, you're the master, I'm the Lord. See, if you want to be a mighty man or woman of God, he's the master, you're the servant. He's the master and Lord, we're the servant. That's what I meant to say. So there's this servant-lord issue. Master, 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 servant, servant, servant. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, Adonai, you master, do I lift up my soul. For you, O master, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. When Moses went up and asked God to rewrite the commandments the second time and not destroy the people, the Lord, key verse, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, the Lord said, I'm going to appear to you, I'm going to come before you, and I'm going to proclaim my name to you. And that name is, another book that Pastor Oz is reading, The Compassionate and Punishing God, an analysis of Exodus 34, 6 and 7. That's one of the main creeds in the Jewish faith. And in it, the Lord speaks that he's compassionate, but he also speaks that he judges the wicked. What's interesting, when David quotes Psalm 34 here, he leaves the part out about that he punishes the wicked, and he only says, Lord, he's, he's, he's quoting Exodus 34. You, Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you for you. Answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord. Adonai, none like you, Master, nor are there any works like yours. Verse 6 was, give ear, to, O Yahweh, to my prayer, but he's back to Master. I'll call you Yahweh because I have a relation with you, but mainly, you're Master, I'm servant. See, that's humility, brethren. That does not exist in the church. Those people on either side of the issues that are angrily, violently, rudely speaking to each other, they, don't, they lack humility. Lord, send humility. Those people that, those, those incendiary Facebook postings condemning their brothers and sisters who don't agree with them. Lord, humble your church, Father, in the name of Jesus. Verse 9, all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, Master, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your ways, Yahweh, that I may walk in your truth. And here's the center of this psalm. Unite my heart to fear your name. We need a humble heart. A servant-master relationship. We need to be the meekest of all people on the face of the earth like Moses. Servant-master like David. That our heart might be united to fear his name. We need to do three things to have a united heart. We need to learn the ways of the Lord at the start of verse 11. We need to walk in his truth in the middle of verse 11. And we need to fear his name. That's humility. That's brokenness. That is what God is going to do. If I never preach another sermon in my life, I'm telling you right now, what is going to happen in this hour 
America is going to be humbled. The church is going to be humbled. But that's to unite our hearts to fear his name, to get back right with God, to get back in unity, to walk in obedience, to stand in awestruck worship that creates devotion to the Lord God and his son by the power of his spirit. I will give thanks to you, my master, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of shale. And who went down to the depths of shale? Korah. And in the midst of, this, of a, a psalm of the sons of Korah, yeah, David says, I, I, I understand. Sons of Korah, you were spared, I was spared. O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life and they do not set you before them. A lot of that going on right now in America and in the church. Insolent men, ruthless men, men and women that don't put the Lord before them. But you, master, are a God. And he goes back again and he quotes Exodus 34. Merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And he doesn't add the punishing God. He just talks about the compassionate God. He leaves something out from the creed because he understands that God in this moment when we are about to go into exile, God, we need your graciousness more than ever. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. He's back to the servant and save the son of your maid servant. I'm a servant who's the son of a servant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Yahweh, have helped me and comforted me. Lord, we are your servants. You are the master. Move mightily in our midst. Humble your church. Humble this nation, O oh God, and bring us to the place where we can really hear you and not hear just the, the beating of our own heart, our own desires, and then just justifying ourselves, O oh God. Father, do that, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Again, I took a lot of time, but God bless you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.